Um, okay, I would now like to welcome Katie back to stage and Natasha to join her for a conversation. chance to see the film after your talk. I think it changed the register also in a way and I would now like more or less that we talk about the film and then we can go back to all the questions that you raised in the talk. Uh, maybe to start with very simple, when you were working on a film did you start from a text or did you start from the idea that you wanted to make a film? No, I'm not a filmmaker as yeah. well as I'm never been doing a visual artistic job, so I'm a writer and playwright, so um, it was of, of course initially a text and then some kind of emergency situation when it had to become an exhibit and that's it. Okay, so the impulse uh, came from dramatic texts and uh, there are a lot of theatrical elements in the film. It also, I would like to hear about your relation to theater and how would it look like if this was not a film, but if the text was theatrical? Well, it is now being done in theater and I'm curious how it will look because I have no connection with it. But, <clears throat> well, uh, um, since it's a dramatic text, uh, it can always involve certain interpretation, like any dramatic text. Any other person can do it in its own and his or her own uh, interpretation. Uh, so, uh, theatrical rendering would definitely make it um, more performative. And, uh, I mean, here you see that uh, the agency of acting is very, I mean, diminished. It's more like statements. It's more the some kind kind of charismatic presences of, of personalities. For instance, such person as Arseny Zhilayev, who is uh, an artist himself and not an actor, or uh, um, um, Dina Gatina, who is a poet and she's not an actress uh, as well. Well, I think. Um, that theatrical element comes as um, performing the impossible, some sort of, some sort of um, sorcery, like something is impossible, something is an impasse, and something is not doable. So you organize it as second reality to, um, to endeavor performing it, although not in real life, and then there is this loop if you perform it, maybe it will transmit itself to reality. So this was always the case with um, performing, and for me, with the extremity of theatrical presence on stage as some kind of extreme second reality. So. And do you think any of this was retained in working on I don't film? think this is a very theatrical piece in terms of intensity of acting. Uh, I think it was more rendering and the agency of camera what here was much more important as some kind of, um, I don't know, witnessing and observing uh, the case and the happening rather than the um, act and artistry of acting as such. Uh, but maybe uh, this is the, also the case of medium. I mean, what is the medium in theater? What is the medium in text? gets changed when you change the medium as the video and then... No, no, of course, that's also why, I, why I'm asking this, but when you are talking about acting, I actually think that the style of acting, I mean, my impression as a viewer, this kind of declarative proclamations are very much, are very suitable for a text that you yeah. wrote, yeah. 
and that uh, it, the, there is some humorous element in how the didactic element of the play is going to. How did you work with that? How how important is didactic element or didactic. manifesto, let's say, an element was? Was it part of your thinking at all? Uh, yes, of course, it's part of the thinking. But unlike theoretical text, this has different timing. It is. Um, it is uh, well. These kind of texts work more like um, contamination. So it's 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 more artistic writing. It it is different in terms of um, type of production. That's why um, there are so many things that are unconscious, and you cannot then go back to this memory. But um, uh, of course, the, the context of, of this debate about the human, post-human, and, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, when you are doing this theatrical thing, what is important is hubris. You are, you are angry, and, and what you can afford in theoretical text, this hubris element, which is so important in theater, you can uh, somehow um, posit in, in performing, in performative... Um, Act. And so I think that the text already contains this act. So I think uh, generally theatrical text is already not text but acted, uh, acted uh, gesture. So um, um, this didactic element is is the war of ideas, and uh, when you cannot transmit the war of ideas uh, when you are. Uh, consecutively and logically constructing the theoretical text, but this uh, noise of and war of ideas is transmittable poetically and uh, in this kind of um, condition and state of mind. But you, would you have a problem with it being didactic or? I was blamed many times that yes, this is yes. too moralistic, this is too didactic, this is, uh, yeah. Uh, I was blamed, but um, I, I, I agree with this accusation. <laughs> that you are, that it is. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but it's uh, also from where it comes. I mean, Sorry for that. I Forgive me. <laughs> yeah, no, I personally, I don't really have a problem because there you know, is much the, more than just that. This element is not well, also the assertion. <laughs> And not that I uh, I want uh, I want endow these uh, uh, states of mind with the authority, but rather the logical. It's like a lo logical constellation. It's like scheme. It's it's quite schematic in terms of like um, like if you remember Brecht's uh, good person. Kind person from Sizuan, you also have the, the prostitute, the oppressor, the oppressed. I mean, you have all this conglomerate of uh, different, um, I don't know, the cosmos of ethics, of human ethics, and then you, uh, you find out how it works, what happens out of it. You know, of course, I, I'm glad you mentioned Brecht because this was one of the association I had when I raised the question of didacticism and theater and what, I mean, I'm still insisting on theater, although of course what we saw is clearly film. And as you said, the camera work for you in making it uh, was as important as uh, the textual element or something. And who were the people you worked with? You mentioned Gilaev and the poet. Uh, I worked uh, with uh, Olga Sherkastup as uh, producer. Uh, she's a curator and young artist. Uh, I uh, well, the majority of young uh, actors here are the um, cast, which is called Theatre Rupor. They are from Chelyabinsk, and um, they are so they are yeah they, they, they are theatrical they are theatrical team. Okay. Uh, and um, there are a couple of performance artists uh, also, but uh, except for these two or three persons, all others were well, part of different theatrical teams. Why was it important to you to have audience? Actually, this was scenes? not my idea. I want to mention especially the um, person who made a montage. This is a, a very out outstanding uh, artist, uh, Viktor Olympiev. 
and um, uh, this was his idea that the actors don't leave the sta stage and they they are present. Then, in, in this way, you have this um, emotion that it's a little bit like funeral. Either it's funeral or it's a theater or it's something is happening there, and either they are mourning or they are witnessing. Uh, so this presence uh, has this element of um, um, tension. Yeah, and you just finished the new film, for which you also wrote the text yourself. Can you say a bit about it? What is the what is it about? Or, what was your starting point? Or, yeah. It's an old text from 2009. And it's about um, uh, religion. It's uh, about theology, exactly. Okay. And um, it's called communion. So it tries to uh, reconsider how the commonality is turning to this extremity of uh, violence towards each other, to be together, and what is the common? Is it violent? Is it violence? Or it's uh, liberation? Uh, maybe something that is common and general is extreme in its, um, um, in its subjugation. Maybe communism was subjugation. Maybe capitalism is freedom. So I don't know. We have to find it out again. I think we have very little time. Maybe my last question, and then we can maybe have a few minutes here. But now, when you evoked again religion, communism, capitalism, well, maybe my last question here before we give it to the audience would be uh, if you can elaborate uh, again on what you were talking also in your lecture about uh, how this surge in what you if I understood, also called pseudo-religion or back to mythological thinking, how this relates to this uh, to uh, communist imagination, communist horizon not being here, not not being dead, let's say, or yeah. Well, I um, I think that uh, this is something that we we are witnessing in uh, um, and. Well, we are witnessing everywhere, and especially in the post-socialist uh, countries, uh, that, um, I mean, the uprising of the radical, conservative, traditionalist, belief-oriented and fundamentalism-oriented, and nowadays even fanatic, fanaticism-oriented, uh, moods, um, which um, I think are, well, as I mentioned, one of the extremes to another extreme of um, uh, technological uh, development and um, uh, advancing of intellect and the endeavor to get away from this collapse into um, into retroactive, uh, obsolete, and uh, reactionary conditions of the obscurant, uh, obscurant types of uh, commonality. Because commonality can be different. There is Gemeinschaft, there is Gesellschaft, there is future horizon of, of the social. But um, I think what is one of the problems of the collapse of the emancipatory and also leftist condition is that uh, it did not manage to construct um, the continuity uh, with the zones of oppression. So I think one of the problems is that the emancipatory thought and emancipatory theory and emancipatory even agencies um, they organized. They were organized as different class with the class that they are talking for. So the oppressed and the left are two different classes. And uh, this, for instance, was the problem in anti-Putin um, uprisings and um, insurgencies uh, in Moscow when the. Um, leftist uh, organizations 
had to back up uh, with the capitalist condition and the neoliberal capitalist condition rather than uh, the most unprivileged parts of the society which um, unexpectedly or expectedly are backing up the traditional conservative uh, moves. And this is the, the case elsewhere. When the majority which is unprivileged and oppressed shifts to the conservative beliefs and then this continuity is already uh, gapping and lost so uh, this is kind of historical problem of I, the I left think this is from and, uh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so 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 th th this is also the the, the, the issue of uh, how um, how classes are organized in constructing the political subject, because political subject is a very complex organization. Uh, it is neither only proletariat, it is nor the avant-garde of the uh, former petty bourgeoisie, which is becoming the leader of the uh, working class or whatever. It, it, it's, it's a very important fusion, um, uh, which is, um, um, not only standing for its own class emancipation or for, for its own rights, uh, but uh, constructing this uh, subject of um, subject of deprivation, uh, the, the universal subject of deprivation. And around this universal subject of deprivation, you are constructing the, the whole equipment of of thinking, theory, and political struggle. And this machine got broken. So it, it got broken also because very often the civil society or the civil rights, um, civil rights or social democracy rhetoric was mistaken for the radical revolutionary rhetoric, for the communist rhetoric. So um, what is uh, the, the communist rhetoric in uh, certain understanding is sometimes quite um, incompatible with the uh, emancipatory uh, civilized leftist rhetoric as it is constructed well in the, in the recent uh, debate. So, um, so what you are saying, kind of doing one so thing. So there is the split, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is the political and social split within emancipatory thought and within emancipatory theory, uh, 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 which undermined itself in, in the long run of, um, well, end of the projects of the political or social utopias, and uh, um, they are considered to be um, past, and, uh, and now uh, it, it's, only, it's only natural and in inevitable that we meet this acceleratory new mythology. But again, this question, in, in this uh, radical acceleration of thought, of um, emancipation, of, of progress, how to construct continuity with the masses? So how to, how to organize? And this, this is the yeah. question. The question how to organize this sentence is crucially central, and it's, uh, nobody says it's going to be fast. Everyone predicts it's going to... It's going to take a long time and we should kind of prepare ourselves for a long time of getting to grip. Well, not with prepare and choose to relax. Yeah, no, that's also a job. One can do both at the same time, I would say. Okay, shall we have one or two questions from the audience and then we can stop? Since we um, use different kind of, um, I will say, world or terms that not really exist, uh, maybe it will be helpful if you can describe for you what is the institution of God, God, how you will describe it. Because I think if we talk about things that are, uh, with money it's much more easy because we can say it's Danish or it's pound, so we know what represent the invention. When we talk about God, can you describe your God? Thank you. My God? <laughs> you you My talk God. about God. So, the God that you are talking about, who is this? Because God, I would say, it's invention. Our cultural invention, common. Um, but 
we coming from different uh, philosophy, ideology, uh, so uh, I think God is the institute to which uh, you can delegate uh, uh, how to be common uh, and how to plug into certain things that are uh, actually stronger than the individual presence. Because this individual solitary presence um, uh, is, is, is a radical lack of existence, radical lack that is part and parcel of our existence is amplified and is um, um, meeting some kind of redemption in, uh, in stronger, bigger uh, agencies. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, um, it's also the, the, the issue of delegating the subject. And today, um, when there is such a rejection within the um, within the zones of oppression for subjectivizing, for um, I mean, for uh, organizing one's um, a militant and uh, radical uh, um, uh, subjectivity, uh, it, it's it's some kind of a very automatic shift when you, you can plug into certain, uh, certain values that are already automatically guaranteeing this strength. And I think that God is this institute that automatically guarantees this strength that you are cool. It's like cocaine. I mean, you are the best, and everyone wants to be the best. So sometimes to be the best, you need God, and so each individual is plugging to God to be the best, but also to be the best, you, you can generalize. You are the best when you are with others. So it's a little bit different ethical and political um, uh, element of interest. And the Marxist obsession was that, uh, I mean, when a human being feels cool with the common interest, this is uh, the common. And when human being feels cool uh, with the private interest, then it's something different. Um, I would just want to make it maybe to connect two things very quickly. Uh, I will say the Institute of God is the Institute of Law. It's one that can make a catastrophe or a miracle. If one believes in catastrophe, one believes in miracle. Yeah. So I would say it's one that changed the law. And our humanity and recognition through the law come with our proximity to God. And this is, I think, kind of characterize everything. I would suggest that, that uh, now that we clear the God, then, then maybe, <laughs> maybe we cannot stop it, so I would set you free. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.